Well, I told you gold was going to win. The betting ace set the line at gold minus six and a half. And what was the final score? That's right. 17 to 10. Mm -hmm. Does this guy know or does this guy know? I called it. I, I set the over under a little bit low on the total. I put it at 22 and a half. Ended up being 27 points. 17 10 win for gold over blue in the blue gold game on Saturday. What do we learn? Not a whole lot, just like we don't ever really learn a whole lot out of these spring games. But that's not true. There's a few things that we learned. There's a few things that I think we know. A few things that sort of lined up with what we saw in in spring camp, and maybe one or two things that veered off course, or we weren't really sure about that we got a sense of. I don't think it was any major res revelations in Saturday's blue gold game at Acrosaur Stadium, but there were some things to note and some things to make uh, you know kind of file away upstairs. As we move forward toward the off season, that long wait until August when they start training camp and the season slowly begins to approach. So let's talk about the spring game. Let's talk about the blue gold game. What I thought, what I saw, what stood out to me. And of course, we'll get your comments in the uh, chat section as well and see if you guys think I was way off base on it. But I nailed the line though. I called the line. Didn't I gold minus six and a half and they win by a touchdown? Sometimes, you know, Vegas, how do they know? How do they know? Let's talk about the spring game here on the Morning Pit. Get your week started on YouTube.com slash Pandolaircom. Yeah, it was a beautiful day on the north side, on the north shore, whatever you want to call that area. I'm surprised I haven't sponsored that yet. Why isn't the uh, why isn't it the Heinz North Shore, you know, or the uh, uh, you know the, the the Highmark North Shore? I mean, if Highmark really wants to take a stab into a UPMC, they should just sponsor the entire North Shore, you know, PNC Park at high at you know Highmark North Shore or uh, you know Ackershore Stadium at Highmark North Shore. Uh, but either way, no matter what you want to call it, it was a beautiful day, a little bit windy, but definitely sunny, sunny. And, you know, I think if we've seen plenty of weather uh, conditions over the years at these spring games. So I don't think anybody would complain about this. A quick aside, you know what the best spring game ever was? I, I mean, like just in terms of setting, temperature, weather, I mean, just everything. It was Highmark Stadium. You know, as, as we talk about Highmark, it was the game at Highmark Stadium. I think it was Pat Narduzzi's first year. I think it was 2015. They moved the game there because there was construction at then Heinz Field, now Ackershore Stadium, same building, different name. Um, but they moved the game over to Highmark Stadium, and it just could not have been nicer. Now, there wasn't room in the press box for everyone. I ended up standing outside, got a sunburn out of that. But I'm not going to complain because it was a beautiful setting. You have a great view of the city from that stadium. The place was packed because that's sort of an ideal size for a spring game if you're pit. Uh, and it's just a great field. It's a great place to do it. And uh, I think it was much nicer and much better than Ackershore Stadium, if you ask me. But nobody asked me. Uh, but if you, you know, if you were to ask me what I think the best spring game I've been to, you know, in 20 years of covering Pitt, I would have to say it was that one. Um, but that was a long time ago. And obviously they'll have it at Acrosaur Stadium whenever they can. That was the case on Saturday. They were down at the stadium. Blue versus gold. The blue team won 17 to 10 was the official score. Whopping two offensive touchdowns. Score, no, three offensive touchdowns scored. Excuse me. Gold scored two offensive touchdowns. Blue scored one. Each team got a field goal. And there were a bunch of punts. How many punts did I count? Seven punts, I believe. And a whole lot of things that we can read into and overanalyze. Just like coming out of the draft last Wednesday, you know, we, we analyzed the draft and we read way too much into that. We can read way too much into what we saw at the spring game on Saturday, either in the rotations, the you know targeting, how they used the uh, the offense, what what it actually looked like, how what the defensive players did, and what maybe stood out on that side of the ball, it's just the spring game. It's not their actual offense or actual defense. It's 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 very small version of it. I think there were about four passing plays that they ran, uh, you know, and, and probably just about the same number of um, defensive. You know, uh, adjustments and keys and calls. But there's still plenty that we can look at. You know what always seems to happen in these things? And it's the weirdest thing. I, I feel like for a while there, there was this, and it may have happened just once, but it felt like it happened a couple of years where the first play they would run like a flea flicker or something like that. They do something like goofy. I think they tried maybe one trick play, this like double flip thing. It, it went to... um. Who did he go to? It was it was early on when it happened. 
Oh, here. It was a uh, fourth drive of the game. The gold, no, the blue team, it was right in the beginning of the second quarter, tried to run a trick play where uh, I think it was Desmond Reed kind of ran a sweep from the left to the right and then was going to flip it to Zion fowler L. But Deion Hayes almost intercepted it like he was Travassier Dennis against the Clemson game a few years ago. He just battered away. Uh, Jake Renda was supposed to be blocking uh, Deion Hayes there. He did not block Deion Hayes there. And Deion Hayes almost swatted, swatted it away. So they always have like one or two of these trick plays in some like goofy kind of stuff. But you know what's weird, and and this was far from the thing that stood out to me the most during the spring game on Saturday. Um, but they use these interesting defensive line alignments where they would have. Uh, I I wrote down a few of them sometimes when I would notice where was oh here's one um in the late in the second quarter before the before the two minute warning and it was like sean fitzsimmons it was a second and long it was second, second and 16 blue team had the ball the gold defensive line had sean fitzsimmons at end sincere edwards at tacker tackle dayon hayes at tackle and elliot donald at end you know they, they like mix it up like that there was another one i wrote down let me find where i wrote it down here in my notes as i was watching the game oh this one was in the fourth quarter Blue had the ball again. Defensive, uh, the gold defense had Antonio came in at, at end. Will King at tackle, which, okay, that's normal. Came in's an end. Came, uh, King's a tackle. And then I'm pretty sure they had David Ojebwe at tackle and Sincere Edwards at end. Uh, so, you know, effectively three ends in one tackle in that alignment. And I think there were a number of times where they had sort of the tackles outside, the, the ends inside. It's very weird. It's not really something we've seen. You know, we've occasionally seen... Uh, sometimes the defensive end will play sort of the nose guard position in in the Delta defensive sub package where they have a three man line and they'll go two pass rushers on the outside and, and an end in the middle. Deslin Alexander would play that role, or sometimes Hobo Baldonado would play that role, and a lot of times they would have a tackle in there anyway. So we've seen things like that. We've never really seen this, whatever it was that they were doing on Saturday or why ever they were doing it. I can't imagine it's some big secret thing that they're going to unleash in the season when they're putting it on tape in the blue gold game, but bizarre you know like ah, let's just throw this out there maybe they want to put it on tape and get teams thinking about it all right we'll talk about the defensive line and all that kind of stuff in a second but i mean you know where we have to start and and it's one of the primary things we've written about all spring long on pantherlair.com and if you followed pantherlair.com i mean you see the website address below panther-lair.com pittsburgh.rivals.com uh one of the main things we've written about on our coverage at pantherlair.com all through spring camp has been the quarterback position. Nate Arnell's position as the the QB1, what's happening behind him with Christian Bayer entering spring camp as QB2, Eli Holstein ultimately passing him for QB2, something that you know we talked about two or three weeks ago. Um, it became sort of more formalized when the players drafted Holstein ahead of Bayer and then was all but solidified. Uh, during the broadcast, because I rewatched the the broadcast yesterday, I wasn't able to attend the spring game in person on Saturday, but I watched it yesterday. And during the broadcast, the broadcasters talked a lot about Holstein passing Bear. They didn't really get too much into detail, other than the fact that Holstein passed Bear. And it seems to me that that probably isn't something they came up with on their own. I think if you listen to those broadcasters, they haven't done a whole lot of research on Pitt themselves. They, uh, you know, had trouble trouble a lot of times just telling the number two from the number three. Uh, but it leads me to believe that during their conversations with Pat Narduzzi, the conversations with Cade Bell, conversations with whoever they talk to in prep leading up to the Blue Gold game broadcast, somebody told them, yeah, Holstein's our number two quarterback right now. And I think when you watched the game, I mean, Holstein played the entire first half. The entire first half was Holstein quarterback for the gold team and Nate Arnell at quarterback for the blue team. No other quarterback played in the first half. You get in the second half, and you start getting a little bit. You know, uh, Vare works the blue team uh, for the first drive. Um, Ty Diefenbach was on the gold team for the second drive. Then back to Vare, then back to Diefenbach, then back to Vare, then back to Diefenbach through the first three drives for each unit. You get into the fourth drive. Nate Yarnell came back out for the blue team, and then Holstein came back out for the gold team. Blue team then got Julian Duggar, and then you had uh, like. Jake Frantel and David Lynch. I think each got a drive at the end. Um, 
but you can kind of, I mean, you can see there. I mean, it was mostly Holstein and Yarnell. Uh, Vayer and, and Diefenbach got, like I said, three drives each, and they went at, <laughs> they went three and out every time. Well, up until the final one, when Diefenbach led a touchdown pass, uh, you know, culminating with a two, uh, you know, basically a screen pass to uh, Kenny Johnson for 18 yards, and that was the only drive out of those six run by Vayer and Diefenbach. The only drive out of those six that wasn't a three and out. And, you know, you don't want to read too much into that. I mean, we talked right from the start. I mean, the reason I set the gold team as the, the, the favorite by six and a half points was the offensive line. And certainly the gold defensive line had a pretty significant advantage over the um, blue offensive line. We thought that that would be the case when we looked at who the blue team was going to be starting on the offensive line going against Dayon Hayes and Sean Fitzsimmons and Sincere Edwards and David Ojebwe and Elliot Donald and all of those guys. Um, I think the, the production sort of followed that. When you look at the gold defense, um, just trying to see some of the stats in here. Scrolling through, Antonio Kamen had two tackles for loss for the uh, the gold team. Dayon Hayes had a sack. Um, you know, Kamen, both of his tackles for loss were a sack. Uh, Elliot Donald had a sack. Um, Dayon Hayes. Had the sack, uh, had five total tackles, had a forced fumble um, where he knocked the ball out of, I guess it was tied deep in box hands. Uh, no, actually, that was that was a different play. That was uh, Rasheem Biles making that play on Diefenbach. And we'll talk about Biles in a second. Where's his? I'm trying to find his stat line here. They didn't include Biles. Am I missing him? Uh, I'm looking over Pitt's official box score, and I, I, I'm i trying to find Rasheem Biles. Oh, there he is. I'm, I'm sorry. B uh, Biles played for the blue team. Uh, but Biles, I mean, I'll, I'll actually, I know I'm talking about the quarterbacks, and I want to come back to the quarterbacks. I think Biles was one of the standout players in this game. I think he was one of the best players on the field he made some of the most plays he had seven tackles um, which stood as a game high total he had two tackles for loss he had broke up a pass he had a sack he had a quarterback hurry he was just all over the place he was reading plays he read a screen uh, for one of his tackles for loss I mean he just had an outstanding uh, blue goal game I thought I thought he was really really good and that sort of tracks with some of the things we talked about all spring we talked about this linebacking core and there's Biles right there popping up on the screen that's sort of perfect uh, but we talked about this linebacking core. Uh, we talked about how good uh, they, they seem to be, how deep they seem to be, how you've got the veteran players like Brandon George and uh, and and Solomon DeShields and then Key Thompson coming in as a graduate transfer, although he really wasn't able to practice at all due to injury. But then you've also got these younger guys, less experienced but really talented, like Rasheem Biles or Kyle Lewis. Braylon Lovelace made plays out there. Jordan Bass didn't participate in the spring game yesterday or on Saturday. Uh, but, you know, I think he's got a really high ceiling as well. I think the linebackers are, I know I said this last year, uh, but I think they are going to be a strength. And I think Biles was, like I say, one of the standout players on defense on Saturday. And I mean, I, you know, I think Dayon Hayes made plays. I thought Sincere Edwards showed some real flashes out there. Elliot Donald was able to get into the backfield, um, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, and obviously the the safeties made plays. Uh, Javon McIntyre came up with, you know, the one interception in the game, which is funny because throughout spring camp he had the fewest takeaways of any of the safeties. I mean, guys like Cruz Brookins and Donovan McMillan and Jesse Anderson and PJ O'Brien were piling up the takeaways all throughout the first fourteen practices of camp. But McIntyre was the one who came up with it. A ball that tipped off of I think it was Kenny Johnson's hands, and he grabbed for an interception. Eli Holstein was on the uh, throwing end of that one. But coming back to the quarterbacks, you know, I thought Yarnell looked looked fine. And, and that sounds like damning with faint praise, but it's really not. I think Nate Yarnell is a perfectly good quarterback. And I think he can be perfectly good enough for this team to win games. You know, I, I really do. And I, and I think he showed that late in the season. I think he, last year, I think if he had played all season, they win eight or nine games. And, and, and probably he can get them there again this season 
Holstein, uh, you know, under 50% on the completion side. Uh, but I, I think there were some things to like. I think there were some things to like about how he's, you know, some of the throws he made. Um, I think, you know, you, you add in sort of what you've heard about him, what, what the coaches have been saying about him, what his teammates have said about him, about how he plays and how he performed this spring. I think the hamstring in, hamstring injury that he was been, you know, he dealt with in February and maybe it was still a bit of an issue. I think there were a few throws that you saw on Saturday that didn't, uh, you know, didn't look the way you would like them to look. And maybe he's still dealing with that injury a little bit. I, I would guess that Holstein, I mean, we'll see, you know, if he gets to 100% after he's got a full summer with the offense, does he push Nate Yarnell in August? Possibly. I would guess that Yarnell will hold on to that job. Um, that's obviously going to, you know, I mean, all of those circumstances are going to give Christian Bayer some real decisions to make. Ty Diefenbach, maybe some decisions to make. I think Julian Duggar, you you know, you feel solid about him. I would have liked to have seen Duggar get some more opportunity in the spring game than he did. I don't know if you really needed as many possessions of, of Yarnell and Holstein as you got. Certainly, you know, sticking with those two guys for the entire first half, particularly when they first, you know, they, they each had relatively long drives. Well, Yarnell's first drive wasn't long, but I mean, Holstein's first drive was a ton of plays had three third down conversions ended in a field goal. Um, I think you probably could have gotten some other guys and rotated a little bit more and gotten more than one drive for Julian Duggar. Uh, maybe even the walk-ons as well. But I think maybe probably the most interesting thing with the quarterbacks was not necessarily how they played, although I thought Holstein made some nice throws. Um, Yarnell had some nice throws as well. I thought Vayer looked largely like he did last season, where he had a couple throws that looked really, really nice. Sometimes he put the ball in jeopardy, and sometimes where you just you're not sure what he was really throwing for. Ty Diefenbach had a nice throw or two. I mean, that touchdown pass that he had to Kenny Johnson, Rasheem Biles, who I talked about, pulled up at the end, um, maybe could have, you know, finished things off there and, and not allowed a, uh, a a touchdown. I think there were a few times where passes were completed by all the quarterbacks. Uh, there was one in particular, Diefenbach threw to Kenny Johnson for 20-yard gain. Javon McIntyre could have killed Kenny Johnson on that play, but he pulled up and, you know, Johnson gets a, a 20 yard gain and, you know, two plays later ends up scoring a touchdown on the play where Biles probably could have got gotten him down or knocked him out of bounds is around the two or three yard line. And so that's always part of it in the spring game. Guys are going to pull up a little bit. They're not going to Pat Naruzzi talked about it before the, the, the game when he was, uh, you know, being interviewed by the broadcasters about, you know, you hope guys are smart. You hope if they have a chance for that kill shot, they don't take it. They pull up. And I think Javon McIntyre did there. I think there were a number of times when guys did that. And that's, that's part of it. I mean, that's part of the spring game. That's going to influence what you get. You know I mean? that That's going to be part of it. And the other part of it too is, you're going to have a very vanilla offense. I mean, how many out routes did they throw on Saturday? It felt like all of them. And and the the broadcasters talked a little bit about, like, boy, they're taking a lot of deep shots. I don't really think they took that many deep shots. I think they threw a lot of out routes. And sometimes they were somewhat deep out routes, but not anything all that crazy. I mean, Eli Holstein just out route after out route after out route. And I'm pretty sure that there's more in this offense than just out routes. Uh, but who knows? Maybe that's their main thing. Maybe that's what they want to do is uh, specialize in out routes. I, I don't think we really got any sense of this offense whatsoever. The tempo a little bit, uh, but I, I don't think what we saw on Saturdays is going to look just about anything like what we're actually going to see. Um, I mean, I think there will be out routes in the sense that I think they want to have kind of quick tempo completions, you know, things that they can hit it quick for four to seven yards and then get back on, uh, you know, get back on the line of scrimmage and try and get another seven and, and keep sort of chipping away like that. I, I could see those passes working in there. Uh, I thought that the touchdown pass to Daniel Carter, um, this was one that I really liked. I, I thought this was a, a pretty slick little play. Um, it, it was, it was nice because Kenny Johnson took Ryland Gandy with him. You know, Gandy followed Johnson and, as that was happening, as Daniel Carter's coming out into the flat, Nick Lappy's coming over to try to, to guard him, to defend Daniel Carter. But 
with the way Johnson ran his route, him and even more so Gandy got in Lappy's way and left Carter wide open. Uh, it was a slick little play, a way to, to, to run the running back open in the flat. Not really a pick play because you sort of, you didn't really, it wasn't really Kenny Johnson who picked Nick Lappy. It was, it was Lappy's own teammate on defense who, who set the pick, uh, you know, unintentionally, unintentionally, of course, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was, it was, it was a neat little play. I thought there were a handful of things that we saw. They were like, Oh, we might be able to do something with that. Um, you know, you might be able to do something with that, you know, during the season and see that kind of thing come up. I do think one thing that stood out from the offense, one, one interesting thing that may be a harbinger or, you know, a bit of an indicator of what we might see this season is a heavy emphasis on Kenny Johnson. He was targeted six times on the first drive. And by my, Little, uh, this isn't a cocktail napkin. It's the back of, it's the back of the spring roster. Actually, uh, I counted twelve targets for Kenny Johnson, more than anybody else. Um, I think, uh, who's that? Twenty three. Zion Fowler L. I think had seven targets. I think Dejon Reynolds had six. Uh, Montrevis Lloyd ended up with five. A handful of guys had four. Gavin Bartholomew had uh, three which I think you'll see more of that. Uh, you'll, you'll see more than that. I, I, what you did see on Saturday was a lot of the tight ends lining up outside. Even like Cole Mitchell was outside on some snaps, uh, which, you know, I don't know if you'll see Cole Mitchell involved all that much, but we did talk about the tight ends lining up outside, and I think you'll see more of that. Um, and the punting. Quick mention here. Um, Caleb Junko had like a 59-yard punt. But he also, his next punt was like 32 yards. Cam Guest had a 31, a 37, and a 30. And not really situations where they were trying to drop, or where they were punting from their own 41 and they wanted to pin it inside the 10. These were punting from your own side of the field and you're punting at 30 yards. Junko had a 32. He had a 44, the two 44s that weren't really very good. Uh, didn't really travel very far. And this is without much of a punt rush. I, I mean... That doesn't look like that situation's been taken care of. A couple of field goals, though. Sam Carpenter and Ben Sauls both one for one on field goals, so that's that's a positive. Um, overall, there's not too much that you can read into these things, as always, like we say. Uh, but uh, you know, we're gonna keep reading into it all week, you know, and and probably beyond that time. But the quarterbacks, the heavy emphasis on Kenny Johnson, um, the 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 really you know limited limited playbook i mean it literally looked like they plucked like three plays out of the playbook and just kept hammering those over and over again and then some standout players on defense i mean guys like biles hayes that's like i said sincere edwards the safeties you know i thought some guys made some plays on that side of the ball jesse anderson showed uh, why he's been getting so much hype in spring camp there was a lot there there was a lot to like over there again playing against a pretty vanilla offense speaking of a lot to like why don't you like this video right here on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantalaircom, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantalaircom. We have all our pit video content right here, morning pit videos, press conferences, highlights, all those kinds of things. You find it right here at youtube.com slash pantalaircom, and we have our weekly live show every Wednesday night at uh, 8 o'clock right here at youtube.com slash pantalaircom. So we're going to be talking about the spring game a lot this week. We'll dive more in on offense and defense, what we saw, what stood out, not just in the spring game, the blue gold game, but also throughout spring camp. A lot of spring camp wrap-up stuff this week and also the latest on any pit basketball news as Jeff Capel had three big visitors in over the weekend. We'll see if any news comes out about that anytime soon. So a lot to uh, look forward to there. But the blue or gold covers, as we predicted, with a great line at six and a half. Uh, oh, and, and the uh, we'll talk about the Ed Conway Award winners too. We're talking about BJ Williams and Cruz Brookins. We got a lot to discuss this week. Uh, look at this video. We're already on like twenty five minutes, and it's been all uh, all meat, no no filler, right? So hope you uh, hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed the uh, Blue Gold game on Saturday. Had a great day at Acershore Stadium, and uh, now. Now it's fully the off season, but believe me, we've always got a lot to talk about. We'll be recapping everything from spring camp, getting a lot of recruiting content in, a lot of recruiting conversation, and of course, uh, all the basketball stuff as well. So thanks for tuning in today. I appreciate it. I hope you had a good time at the, the stadium on Saturday. I hope you had a great weekend overall. 
And uh, hope your Monday goes well. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow on The Morning Pit right here on YouTube.com slash